Hey everybody, this is Kenny. Welcome back to another edition of the Leading from the Middle podcast. This is a podcast for middle managers who want to develop themselves, develop their teams, and improve their results. We're going to really focus on improving the results today as in our, my never-ending quest for you to just be really well-rounded in your leadership style. You've got to also be compliant and worry about the operations of the business. And I have got the compliance evangelist, author, podcaster of the Compliance Network, founder and podcaster of the Compliance Network, Tom Fox, who calls himself, and you'll see why he calls himself that. It is true. He is the compliance evangelist bringing the good news about compliance. You don't want to miss a second of this. Let's get at it. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Leading from the Middle podcast. This is the podcast for middle managers who want to develop themselves, develop their teams, and improve their results. And so we're going to really, really emphasize not only on leadership today, but improving their results because I have got the person that is going to help with that, that has really devoted all their time, space, and energy to compliance and, and, and really tying that in with leadership. So I want to introduce author, podcaster, founder of the Compliance Network com, uh, podcast, the Compliance Evangelist. I love that title. Tom Fox is with us today. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Good. Great. Uh, thrilled to be here, Ken. Awesome. 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 Um, I want to start with telling us a little bit why you chose the name the compliance evangelist where did that come from so in greek ancient greek uh, evangelist was the bringer of good news and i think compliance no i don't think i know compliance is the good news most people think of compliance as the land of no populated by dr no because anytime you go to the compliance, if you're in the corporate world, they're going to tell you no. Yeah. Well, uh, I have worked uh, for the last 15 years to change that perception because I see compliance uh, effective. Uh, it, compliance equates to more efficient business processes, which at the end of the day makes your company more profitable. Mm. So that properly seen, compliance is a business process that's going to make your business run better. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. I love that. And bringing the good news on that and kind of flipping the script. Um, so what what made you choose um, or want to start? What was Where did the passion come from to want to start the Compliance Podcast Network and really focus all your energy and attention on that? What, what was your backstory on having all this passion for this? So it started in uh, 2007. I became general counsel of a company that had unfortunately had a very large compliance violation leading to a huge fine. And I was part of the management team that was brought in uh, to clean up the mess and then put a new compliance process in place. Mm -hmm. That was my first ex exposure to compliance. And I learned how do you uh, build a compliance program inside of an organization. Uh, the company was sold. My job went away. I decided what I really wanted to do with my life was race bicycles. I was 50, I could uh, ride in the senior circuit. So I went off on this great journey to race bicycles for a year until one day I was uh, taken out by a Hummer oh. on a training ride. So oh. that ended my cycling career. Yeah. And I realized I was gonna have to go back to work. And so uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, I was a trial lawyer for 25 years and I went in house. And then, uh, so it's now 2010 and I decided what I really enjoyed was my last job where I built compliance programs. Mm. And in 2010, there weren't very many lawyers who did that. There were lawyers in other areas of compliance, but not in the nuts and bolts. So I decided I would focus on the nuts and bolts. I would help corporations build compliance programs, design, create, and implement compliance programs. And I advocated, or I said I was a nuts and bolts guy. And um, I blogged. Uh, first of all, I was laid up from my wreck. And the yeah. only time I could leave my house was to go to physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And I literally created, at that point in my life, I knew nothing about social media. I started Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of that at the same time. And I built a worldwide consulting practice out of my house mm -hmm. simply because I couldn't go anywhere. Uh, I couldn't meet anyone, couldn't go to a conference, couldn't go to dinner, couldn't have a drink, couldn't call on a customer. 
Wow. So I developed this worldwide practice. The podcasting came out of blogging and it was just a natural extension of my social media outreach. So in 2012, I started my first podcast. In 2017, I got the bright idea that there were three large trade organizations in my area. So I went to each one of them and said, look, let's form a consortium. We'll create one resource in the podcast format for compliance professionals uh, and so we'll be the one resource and oh, by the way, we'll corner all the advertising. Not that I would ever suggest anti-competitive behavior, but, uh, <laughs> and I could get no interest, zero. No one said, said anything. So I just said, you know, leap it, I'll do it myself. And so I did. In 2019, I decided, okay, it's time to commit to this or not. I took the year off from practicing law, built out this huge network bought all the cool toys. I was set up to go. And I, at the end of the year, I'd made about $10,000. So I thought, well, that was a nice experiment. I guess we're gonna have to go back to practicing law, which for me meant practicing compliance law. Mm -hmm. And so I did that until the country shut down in March of 2020. Yes. And two months later, I literally got the same call from every product provider in my space, which was how long to get access to your network. Mm. Because all marketing and compliance was done in person, either trade shows, conferences, rap, breakfast roundtables, dinners, et cetera. And of course, no one could do that. And because of the work I'd done in 2019, my answer was 24 hours. It was literally just a plug and play. Mm. And by that time, I had the largest social media following. And I had 30,000 followers of huge social media presence. Wow. And so my little world blew up. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, so since that time, I've been trying to consolidate the gains that I literally made, you know, in three, the first three months of the pandemic. Uh, and that's led to the, I'm now full time uh, compliance podcast network podcaster. I have two other podcast networks. Yes. And I just, uh, I love podcasting because I get to do what we're doing is talk to, really cool, interesting people all day long. Wow. What a story, man. I love it. And, uh, and even, well, thank God you're okay um, from that terrible accident first, but it, it's it, it's amazing how that kind of forced you to stay home. And then here comes the pandemic that really forces you to do uh, something else. Uh, what, any, any lessons you learned along that journey? It was, is there anything you would have done a little differently? Well, the lessons I learned from the first time uh, back in 2010, um, I'd always known that when one door closes, the universe opens the second door. Yeah. Uh, first, you have to learn to see it. And by 2010, I could see it. But the step or the thing I learned then was have the courage to walk through it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Now, part of that courage was because I had literally nothing else to do. So maybe that helped. But that's the biggest lesson I learned. One of the two best pieces of advice I got from a colleague were um, you have to give this at least six months, but really a year mm -hmm. to see if it's going to work. And two, if that's what you want to do, great. Just don't take other work. Just fully commit to it. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And that's how I built the first business. Mm -hmm. From the pandemic, the lesson I learned was when preparation meets opportunity, luck occurs. And obviously I got very lucky during the pandemic, yeah. but it was because of the work I'd done the year before. If I had not fully committed to the podcast network in 2019, I don't know if I could have built out a whole network while onboarding literally two to four customers a day. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Um, and that that's just a phenomenal story. So what's the Texas Hill Country Podcast Network? What is that all about? So I live in a part of West Texas called the Hill Country, which is just that. It's hilly. Only part of Texas that's hilly. Uh, I think it's the most beautiful part of Texas. And when I got here, we moved here in March of 2021, <clears throat> there weren't any podcasts. So uh, it took me a while to start a podcast. Uh, so by the time I started, I was number three. And um, some other guys had started a podcast and they found out about my expertise with the network. And so they approached me about uh, starting a local podcast network, which is something I'd wanted to do. Uh, so we started the Texas Hill Country Podcast Network 
It's focused on the geographic region of the Hill Country. It's rural West Texas. And so we wanted to build it out and see if that business model works for the podcast world. Mm-hmm. Um, over the past two weeks, I've started a third podcast network. It's the Texas Podcast Network with a broader geographic scope. And I'm just uh, fully committed to podcasting now. So I'm going to take these business models. But what I'm going to do with the Texas Podcast Network, I've gotten interested in chat GPT and as a business resource. Mm -hmm. So for the Texas Podcast Network, chat GP is going to be my business resource book. Okay. And I'm going to do a case study around, can you use chat GPT uh, to help you build a business? So for instance, my first creation was a business plan and I, my business plan is, is based on chat GPT. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's been fun for me to use that uh, to learn about chat GPT and see if we can build out something uh, on a broader geographic scale for the Texas podcast network. Wow. Wow. Uh, it's, it's just expanding for you, man. That is, that is fantastic. I I love it. I want to veer off uh, a little bit and maybe it's not a veer off, but I, I found it crazy interesting and I'm anxious to hear you talk about it. You mentioned that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has just changed everything. Um, walk us through that. What did you mean? So I, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine changed business forever in five key ways. Uh, my compliance podcast network is a B2B network. It's about 40% corporate types listen, uh, business executives, CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, et cetera, about 40% compliance officers, and about 20% legal legal types, whether in-house or in private practice. So that network goes to a business audience. And what I tried to do with, uh, I started a podcast on that subject. I wrote uh, several white papers and I, that was my 2022 sort of stump speech. Business has changed and you need to be ready. And so it's in five key areas. Number one, supply chain. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the Russian invasion didn't change these. It just took trends that had been percolating along. So obviously supply chain was changed dramatically during the pandemic. And now the one of the biggest countries in the world, Russia, uh, we can't use as a supplier. So that's changed. Number one, number two, we've had we're now on our eleventh round of trade and economic sanctions. So the world of sanctions has changed, both in terms of trade, exports, and a uh, third one of money laundering. Mm. Uh, number three, uh, my compliance world. I come out of the world of anti-corruption compliance, and. In 2021, the Biden administration elevated anti-corruption compliance to a national security issue. So uh, when you something becomes a national security issue, it gets the focus of the regulators, it gets funding, and it's a lot more important. So anti-corruption compliance has changed forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, cybersecurity is, it should be at the very forefront of your mind if you're in the corporate world. That's only accelerated because Russia has made clear they will use that non-kinetic style of warfare to attack any country that's against them. And so our corporations are under continual attack. And the final area is ESG. Uh, Once again, not a new trend, but it had been percolating along. And with ESG, you can, uh, don't think of ESG as this whole cultural debate of wokeness or not wokeness. ESG is a business process. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer in business process. Because if you have a business process, it makes your business more efficient and at the end of the day, more profitable. Mm -hmm. So ESG properly seen is a business process. And the reason it is such a innovation is it's the first time those three areas, environmental, sustainability, and governance have oversight by one person in a corporation. Now it could be a board of directors, it could be a committee, but never before has there been someone overseeing all of those Once again, that makes your business process more efficient rather than it be siloed. So those are the five areas that uh, business has changed forever because of the Russian invasion or the Russian invasion really put an exclamation mark on things that were changing largely because of the pandemic. Tom, that's amazing. And um, do you see these areas getting better 
going forward? Because you obviously done an outstanding job sounding the alarm on some of these. And I'm sure, you know, you probably had some CEOs that were like, man, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. Okay. I did think about that, but I didn't think about that. Uh, do you see this starting to get better now that there's more awareness or is this, is this going to get worse over time? And I want to ask you about China in a second. Uh, great, because I'm ready on China too. But yeah. um, actually, if I could p- perhaps reframe it, yes. when you have change, you have an opportunity. Mm. And every time there's a change, there's a new business opportunity. And supply chain is probably the most dramatic. Uh, the U.S. It was built out on supply chains into countries like China, Taiwan, uh, Russia, uh, you name the country. The pandemic made some of those countries uh, not available to us simply because the infection rates were so great and people couldn't work and people couldn't supply. So we had that. Russia uh, ended uh, the ge- a geographic component of our supply chain simply from Russia. But with every change bring- means an opportunity. So now you hear the term reshoring. It's bringing things back to the United States. The Biden administration has the Semiconductor Act because it's deemed in the national interest for the U.S. to have semiconductor production inside the United States. Those are huge opportunities uh, to reshore your supply chain inside the United States. It means jobs. It means income. It means a level of certainty. So if you move towards those, uh, identify where your business can fit in, and then identify the risks and manage those risks, I think you have a huge opportunity Uh, I have one friend who has estimated that the S in ESG sustainability has nearly $50 trillion of business opportunity available. Oh my gosh. So once again, whether it's not a a wokeness or cultural issue, it's a business opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, The world is going to become more environmentally conscious because we have to. Yeah. And that means opportunity. So I see these as huge business opportunities. And uh, if you are still depending on a supply chain from an at-risk area, whether it's at-risk for a hurricane, whether it's at-risk for a winter storm, whether it's a fire such as in California, those are things you need to be aware of now and be prepared to pivot and shift for business resiliency reasons. Mm -hmm. That's amazing um, how you shifted that and you're you're 100% right. Uh, I, so I, let, let's get to China because you are, have a lot of concerns there as well. What what do you foresee there, and, and what are you telling some of your customers and clients about? You know, oh man, pray for that. Right, is a pending showdown we're going to have at some point, probably with China. So uh, I hope it doesn't lead to a shooting war. Yeah. So I'm going to sort of leave that out of it because yeah. that's obviously worst case. But think about your supply chain. How much of your supply chain is in China? Equally important, how much of your supply chain is in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Because if China moves militarily against Taiwan, if China moves uh, to embargo them or, or, you know, put their Navy around them where they can't get their products out and your major suppliers are in Taiwan, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. So supply chain is going to be a huge issue, but it's also going to be a huge issue for American sales. I, the U.S. timber industry is the largest supplier of wood to China. Mm. And if your biggest purchaser is in China and that market is no longer avail- available to you, you need to be able to shift or at least reorient your sales to another buyer. Now, there may be other parts of the world that just have just as biz- big an opportunity but you're not using them because you got a contract and you got a customer and they're paying you on a regular basis. But if that market's not open to you, then you need to worry about uh, or or rather have alternative markets to you. So it works both ways, both on the supply chain side and the sales side. Mm -hmm. The cybersecurity issue is just as important with China as it is with Russia because they are running hacks just as much as Russia is. China has focused on military and larger strategic attacks on our cyber system or cybersecurity than Russia. Russia has focused on the business angle, but I would fully expect China uh, to move to that. So that's going to be uh, equally important as well. 
it's going to uh, be a huge amount of focus on other Asia Pacific countries other than China. Mm -hmm. So uh, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, you name the country is going to become much more uh, interdependent with America because it's in our interest to prop up their economies as a counterbalance to China. It's what uh, President Obama tried to do with the TPP, Trans-Pacific Program, where it was going to be an economic uh, ring around China, and the Trump administration did away with that. Well, now we need to have that sort of economic relationship with those countries so that we can be there to support them if China uh, does something against them. Wow. Wow. And, and I, I, I'd i like to, and you, you validated something that I've been thinking to first of all, again, I'm hoping everybody's listening to you because you're you're far ahead of the game. But I, I when you talked about the timber and us being the you know major China's uh, you know the majors we're the major supplier to them, but that I I just I continue to think that neither Russia or China really want this to go down the road that sometimes it seems like it's going down. Am I am I often saying that because there's it's lose lose if you know, in both ways, it would just take uh, take away the shooting thing, like you said, but just economically, isn't it lose-lose on, on all of our ends? It's certainly not in their interest, no. Yeah. Uh, and that's why, obviously, there are other interests. Uh, Putin has other interests right now, and he's pursuing those. China has other interests uh, that we either, uh, I don't want to say we don't appreciate them because we understand them, but they're perhaps so d different to what we perceive as an interest, we really don't fully understand them. Uh, look at uh, Taiwan's probably the biggest example. They obviously took Hong Kong back from the British. That was a trial run for the takeover of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think it would happen as quickly, but because of things the Trump administration did, he gave China a free reign in Hong Kong. And we see the result, the uh, crackdown, the anti-democracy, all of that. That's coming to Taiwan. And so now America sees uh, pretty blatantly what's going to happen to Taiwan. And we have to decide, is that something that we are willing to allow? Because if it happens to Taiwan, every one of our allies in that part of the world is potentially at risk. South Korea, uh, Japan, the Philippines, uh, the Vietnam, uh, even as far as Singapore has to be concerned. So we as Americans have to be concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This has been amazing. I, I want to I want to make sure I get this in, though, because I want to now kind of bring it to uh, that that manager that is running a retail store, a restaurant, and uh, it, they struggle with being well-rounded, right? Um, maybe they're really good with their people, but they're not as good in compliance. What's two or three pieces of advice that you would have for them, Tom, to really step up their game when it comes to compliance? What are a couple of practical things that they could do running their business every day that uh, not only balances the sales, it balances their their people, but it also keeps them compliant. So the, the biggest thing is, listen, the biggest thing employees want is a boss, is a manager, is a supervisor, is a CEO, is to listen. And if you listen, you can start to engender trust. Mm -hmm. And that's where the magic happens, because if an employee trusts their boss, they're willing to go in and say, hey, I saw this thing happen. Now, the thing could be a potential legal violation, but they could also be, you know, I had this idea, we might be able to do something a little better. Mm -hmm. And when you start having that sort of dialogue between an employee and their manager, between an employee and a senior executive, between a middle manager and a senior executive, that's where you can make real improvement in an organization. By creating that trust, you create values which are going to keep almost all people doing business legally and hopefully ethically, which will prevent compliance. So it's really about the culture you create. Mm -hmm. And if you're a manager, if you're a senior executive, wherever, whatever your role is, if you lead someone or some people, if you start out by listening and gendering trust and then cre can create that dialogue, uh, that's going to, lead you to being compliant, but it's going to lead you to having a better organization. So I've really come around to seeing values and culture 
as the number one uh, most important thing because really it all flows from that. And it starts at the top. You mentioned if if you're a restaurant, if you're the manager, if you're a CEO of a 500, Fortune 100 corporation, you know, it's you. Wherever you are in your organization, you make the first step. You make people know that your door is open. You're willing to listen. You're not going to retaliate. You're not going to laugh. You're going to listen to what they say. If it makes sense, perhaps you can incorporate it into uh, going forward. And once you engender that trust and you have those values, uh, I think everything else will flow from that. So that's what I would say to the to the business leader that's listening to this podcast. That's great advice. Great advice. And uh, I tell leaders this all the time. You know, you you shouldn't be the expert on closing that sale, right? You should be the best coach, but not the best salesperson. And, you know, everybody should know something, right? Everybody brings some value to the table. And if you are fostering that open atmosphere that you just talked about and you're able to have those conversations, heck, you know, you I, I didn't know that that was leaving through the back door or I didn't know that we were supposed to count that. I can't tell you how many times in my career someone pointed that out that was, quote unquote, in a position that, you know, was below management. Um, I love that. I love that. That is outstanding. Tom, this has been amazing. And uh, it, it is um, it, this is the most different podcast I've done uh, in a while because uh, you really talk about leadership from quite a different point of view. Um, I'm going to post it all over the place when I send this out, but I love to always ask, how can people get in touch with you? So if they want to check out the Compliance Podcast Network, that's at www.compliancepodcastnetwork.net. Uh, my blog site is on there. I blog uh, pretty much every day as well. I post four to six podcasts a day. Um, I have, um, if you want to have any questions or want to reach me, I'm at uh, email is tfox, T-F-O-X at tfoxlaw.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter at, uh, at tfoxlaw. Love to engage with your audience. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy uh, to respond. Awesome. Awesome. I'm sure they will. Uh, because I think we just scratched the surface. This was fantastic. Tom, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know how busy you are and for making the time to uh, to really educate us on uh, just heighten that awareness more on compliance. And it, it is amazing. I love your title, The Compliance Evangelist. I just love that. Uh, you're bringing the good news is right. So thank you again. And, um, and, and I'll, I'll certainly be in touch. Well, Kenny, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to visit with you and your audience. Oh, my pleasure. So folks, this has been the Leading from the Middle podcast with Kenny and with Tom. Talk to you real soon.